Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Week Ahead. I'm Tony Nash. This week, we're joined by Albert Marco and Adam Tumarkin. Um, there's a lot going on with debt ceiling and Fed, and obviously we've seen markets late in the week start to um, really accelerate a bit. Um, and we have a few things to talk about uh, this week. First, we're gonna start with EVs. We saw some numbers come out with Ford over the last couple of weeks, and I've wanted to cover this. So we're gonna go to EVs a little bit, uh, the economics of EVs. Um, we're also gonna talk about how to trade the debt ceiling. Um, we're getting into that part of the debt ceiling discussion where it's kind of on and off again. Uh, and so this is where it gets really fun. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that, what's going on in Capitol Hill and, and kind of how to trade it. And then we're gonna talk about China. We're gonna talk about kind of anemic China and, um, and Adam's gonna go into that a, a fair bit. So guys, thanks so much for taking your time today. Um, I always appreciate this. Um, Albert, I wanted to uh, to talk to you about EVs. Um, we saw that Ford reported a $2.1 billion loss for their EV unit in fiscal 22. Uh, and then with their Q1 earnings, they reported another $722 million loss. So uh, if they keep that up, that's a, you know, that's almost a $4 billion loss uh, for this fiscal year if they keep that up. Um, we've got some tweets up from a guy named uh, Robert Bryce. I don't know him, but it's it's a really good um, thread. So I wanted to put it up and I'm sure he's a great guy. So if you guys want to follow him, that's fine. Um, but what he's saying is that um, Ford loses $66,000 on every EV it sells, which just seems crazy to me. So, you know, we see the reality of Ford's p and and then we hear kind of the uni unicorns and rainbows of EVs. And I'm just curious, Albert, can you walk us through some of the economics of EVs? And, you know, we see Tesla making a profit now, but we see Ford kind of having a tough time with it. So how does this work out? It doesn't work out. They're all lost. They, they don't. They don't make any money. I mean, Tesla doesn't make, they can report that they're making money, but they're not really making money on the cars. They might be making a little bit of money, you know, with tax manipulation or services. Subsidies. Or Subsidies. Yeah, that's one of the things. The costs are so high that without government rebates, no one can afford EVs. I mean, if there was a Porsche, I believe, was, you know, they, they said that their cars are about 140000 for the base model take on EVs to, to to actually, if you were to buy them, you know, right off the, with them making no money, that's what it would cost. But a lot of these companies, they need government rebates to be able to be in this game long term. And that's where, you know, that's where this uh, little drive or EV, um, the EV push out of and manufacturers is coming. You know, the reality is that manufacturers need government subsidies, government help, stimulus bills, so on and so forth. So they have to play ball politically. Uh, the, the material that is needed for EVs is much higher than normal combustion engines. So there's there's just no value add. There's less jobs that will be produced. So that's a little bit of savings on the manufacturers. Now, the big one that absolutely nobody is talking about is uh, recalls uh, dependent because of the fire risk to the manufacturers. Once those once fires start popping up, I mean, you saw a couple of Tesla, but once they start happening because of certain defects in the materials or the engineering those costs are unknown right now to manufacturers mm. nobody wants to talk about that yet yeah we had a in the neighborhood next to mine last year we had a tesla autopilot crash and it burned and the the fire was so hot that it it melted the pavement below the car both people in the car died and the fire department could really do nothing but wait for it to burn out yeah, I mean, you even have instances of spontaneous combustion of Teslas and other EVs in the garages as they're charging overnight. And they're just, right. you know, this is really an unknown thing that manufacturers are going to have to struggle with and investors are going to have to try to figure out how to price in when they're talking about going long uh, EV companies or you know, GM, Ford and Tesla. Yeah, I guess, you know, the, one of the questions I have in terms of the economics is, um on some level, it's a little bit more like a laptop manufacturing process than a traditional car manufacturing process. I mean, when I talk about EVs with people, I say, look, it's a laptop with wheels. And I know that's a huge oversimplification, but, mm -hmm. you know, you're sourcing a lot more electronics there. You know, you're sourcing batteries. There's a lot of code. There's there's software updates, you know, all of this stuff. Right. So. 
you know, I've always wondered for the traditional automakers, like the Fords and the GMs and the Porsches and these sorts of guys, I, I don't really know that it's necessarily something that they have an advantage for. Maybe they have an advantage on the distribution. I have no idea, but but the manufacturing process is very different. And Ford even now has three different business units, one for commercial, one for uh, consumer, and then one for EVs, because the entire process is so different from the traditional auto manufacturing process. Yeah, and the costs associated with retooling factories and opening up new factories really still hasn't been factored in, in my opinion. Right. I think in, in the future, uh, you'll start seeing some massive, massive uh, drawdowns in finances from these companies. With CI Futures, you can access AI-powered market forecasting for as low as $20 a month. Get 94.7% market forecast accuracy for over 1,000 assets across commodities, currencies, equity indices, economics, and stocks. With weekly updates, one-month and three-month error rates, and top 10 and bottom correlations, you can rely on CI Futures to help you make informed decisions. Join a growing number of satisfied users who have already transformed the way they invest with CI Futures. Don't wait. Start forecasting with confidence today for as low as $20 a month. Yeah, and so a um, couple things. So Inflation Reduction Act, without the Inflation Reduction Act, would the, you know, would the earnings of guys like Ford look a lot worse? Oh, absolutely. Without those rebates kicking in and all these other inflation tailwinds, it'd be a lot worse. It'd probably be a, you know, a third of what they're reporting would be just wiped away. Okay. And so um, what is the drive on Capitol Hill for this? I mean, I know we have the AOCs in that group who are pushing the Green New Deal. I understand that. But say you're, you're you know, generic politician. Why are they pushing for this? Because EVs are typically bought by people who make $150,000 a year or more, okay? Um, and so it's not a broad base of the population who can actually use this stuff right now. So why are politicians uh, angling for this? And as I asked that question, um, I live in Texas and, and this week, Texas has started uh, uh, discussing putting a tax on EVs because EVs don't pay gasoline tax. Mm -hmm. So they're not paying for any road care, right? Gasoline tax, part of a gasoline tax goes for is road maintenance and new roads and that sort of thing. So Texas is looking at, I think it's $300 a year for EV owners. Um, and that will go for maintenance and upgrades of roads. But, you know, on Capitol Hill, why is there such a push for this? Well, mainly because the donors uh, behind the politicians are so heavily invested in ESG and carbon con, I mean, carbon credits, you know, programs and whatnot. So that's that's where the push comes from. It comes from Wall Street. OK, and then for the, the companies like Ford and, and these other publicly traded companies, are they just trying to get kind of the valuation uplift? in the short term, I mean, that that's kind of what I assume is um, they're getting a valuation uplift because they're kind of doing EVs. And then by mm -hmm. the time, uh, say, the the downside comes, that CEO will be out of the out of the seat. Is that kind of the game they're playing or is there something more? And I know this sounds really cynical. I know there are people watching who really support EVs. Um, so give us some comments or whatever. But I, I'm just curious, like, are they true believers that we, you know, we have to have uh, electric automobiles, or are they more focused on kind of shareholder creation or va shareholder value, value creation, short termism, and then they'll worry about all the details later on? That's exactly right. They're sitting there just to boost their stock price and then satisfy their investors. I mean, anything EV was just flying off the, uh, you know, flying in the stock market, and they're just playing it. And I don't blame them. I mean, I'd probably right. do the same thing if I was a CEO and sit there and raise money off the stock uh, stock valuations afterwards. There's no right. question. Of it. I mean, if they really wanted to do something for the for uh, for clean air and whatnot, they would have had buy fuel with uh, natural gas, like the Saudis and the Germans used to have. It's clean burning. Yeah, you know. And it, and I lived in Asia for a long, long time. Every single, uh, well, probably not now, but up until a few years ago, every single taxi in Hong Kong was natural gas powered, and yep. so. You know, very clean, right? And very you know, clean, and there's no efficient and cheap. 
yeah, there's no adjusting the factories. I mean, it's just a couple of bolts and kit. a couple of tanks and whatnot. And yeah. it's a kit that can bolt right on. Right. Yeah. Adam, what do you think about this on the on the EV front? Yeah, so um I agree. I think I think the EV market is it's getting kind of saturated, especially at a pretty bad time. Like you said, Ford, uh, they reported huge losses on every EV they made. We saw the price, of, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the Tesla price cuts um, recently. And I think that there's just going to be a glut of cars, uh, manufacturers trying to get sales going at a time where you have auto loans um, increasing. Uh, it's pretty significantly negative equities increasing on cars. Used car prices are falling, not as much, but in year over year terms they have. So we've seen negative equity build. We've seen like uh, Capital One, I believe, Wells Fargo, they already started closing and divesting their auto loan um, underwriting right. uh, area. So I just think it's going to be, there's only really two options you would have as a car manufacturer. If they were able to restrict inventory the last couple of years to keep prices higher, but when you're having others cut prices like Tesla, I think it's just going to start leading to a potentially a price war which will be good for the consumer but you know it's not going to help these companies right so do you think we'll see and i, I know this may be a little bit early in the game but would we see a company like ford maybe spin off their ev unit and let it accept those losses and let the let the shareholders kind of hold it until it becomes profitable or do you think it's so core to their business that that they've got to hold on to it um i think if it keeps losing money like this they might have to do something like that but i do think every car company kind of want they're banking on evs for the future you know with like uh, probably more government subsidies they're going to do more infrastructure so i'd imagine they want to keep those things but i mean yeah it's definitely a possibility and they help to balance out their overall emission standards requirements right all the cafe yeah. standards yeah. so i guess they have to keep it for that so yeah, some kind of some kind of net neutrality like carbon credits or something they would yeah they would need something so them using evs i, I think they can you know it, it can net out for them yeah so okay and you make a good point about auto loans i mean with that happening uh and especially with the price point that evs are at and with interest rates rising uh i think that's a huge factor that we see coming um as people start to look at uh at their their spend every month and how to allocate it and what to do i think you know, it's uh, it, it's going to be a really interesting trade off that we see, and I hope these guys can figure it out. Um, uh, I hate to see the subsidies, you know, continue to pile on, but um, but let's see what happens there. So, okay, um, let's talk about the debt ceiling, obviously. Um, we've got things going between, say, uh, U.S. House of Representatives leader uh, Kevin McCarthy and the White House with Joe Biden, and Biden's delegated a couple people to to negotiate on his behalf. Oh, that's great. Um, there was a lot of excitement this week that we may have an agreement by this weekend, which seemed really kind of silly uh, when people got excited about it. Um, but, you know, this uh, debt ceiling debate comes up almost every year, not every year, but almost every year. Um, I think we saw back in 2011 where, or, and, and even more recently than that, where, you know, national parks people and other federal government employees were kind of furloughed and, you know, all this sort of thing. Um, I haven't expected it to, you know, we, we also hear Yellen uh, say that the U.S. government will be out of money by June 1st. Um, I've never expected a debt ceiling agreement by June 1st. Um, uh, we've always expected volatility toward going into the end of May and in early June. Um, most of the people who I, I see who've been around the block a little bit expect the same thing, uh, although we hear a lot of kind of hang, hand wringing in, uh, in a lot of the financial media, um, which it's serious if there really is a default, that's serious, but default really isn't on the table. Uh, so um, Albert, you know Capitol Hill a lot better uh, than I do. Um, can you kind of give us uh, an idea of what's happening on the ground and what some of the implications are of the discussions that are happening right now? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've tweeted this and said this many times, but both sides are, <laughs> let me let me put it in a way that one of the GOP guys told me, he's like, both sides are in World War II and and entrenched in their in their positions, just waiting the other one out. Uh, it, it, you know, normally I would say it's a debt ceiling thing. It'll get done. It's a bunch of 
grandstanding, so on and so forth. The problem with this time around is that the majorities in the congressional, in the House and the Senate are so thin that it's a problem, right? It's a problem from actually finding a deal because you could always get, you know, 10, 12 House members to, you know, defect just because they got elections coming up and it wouldn't be a problem. But the numbers don't work this time around for that. And the, and the, the fail safe for some of the hardcore Republicans in the House is that they can call a, a vote for McCarthy's leadership, which would stall any kind of legislation from going through. Um, on the flip side, in the Senate, you don't really have the Democrats unified to get the debt ceiling done because of some of the because some of the details involved of workers, you know, you know, worker rights. I think it was like the requirement to find work for unemployment. Uh, some of the EV stuff, some of the, you know, some of the cuts in a couple programs that the Republican, the Democrats were actually uh, venomously against. So I just, like I said, I don't think the deal is going to be done until probably mid June. The whole, the whole June first deadline is complete, complete nonsense. Just ignore that. The U.S. will be able to pay their bills up until late August or early September in any case, but we'll, they'll have a deal done well before that it, it might cause some turmoil in the market which you guys can talk about trading it um probably setting up a stimulus or economic deal coming in september or october of this year okay so there's a lot there's a lot there so um i, I want to ask you know we can talk about the white house and we can talk about uh capitol hill but Yellen is a key player here and depending on the day either the the treasury finds money oops, you know, like we found $10 billion that we didn't know we had, um, or it's super urgent and they don't know where they're going to get the money, depending on the news flow and the day and the time of week and how negotiations are going, that sort of thing. What? How do you think Yellen will play this and why does she continue to come with, um, with messages that are, that differ by the day or every other day? Well, I mean, things are fluid, both economically and politically at the moment. They want to scapegoat for a, mar a little bit of market turmoil because of political PR uh, narratives that they need to push out for the election. So Yellen wants the market to sell off a little bit and have the Republicans take blame for it so she can get a better you know, debt ceiling deal done and a stimulus bill or an economic package in the fall. She wants to recharge her TGA account and use it at will. Right. Now, California also had a three month delay on their income taxes for whatever reason, uh, cold winter or something like that. So um, that money will start coming into the Treasury in mid June. Right. Or should be in the Treasury by mid June. So could that potentially be a reason for the Republicans to drag their feet, knowing that more money will be uh, in the Treasury in mid June? Well, I, I listen. I wouldn't give the Republicans or anyone in Congress that sort of that sort of uh, competence when it comes to th those things. I mean, I'm seriously like I talk to a lot of them and it's mostly, you know, deer and headlights when you start bringing this subject up, you know, disbelief in deer and headlights. This is really reserved for the financial guys that see what the political side is doing. So do the financial guys know what they're doing? I mean, a certain the certain upper echelon certainly does. Right. You know, the guy's throwing out zero day trade, zero day equity uh, call options to rally the market. They sure as hell know what goes on. Right. OK. Um, and then you talked about a stimulus stimulus package in kind of late Q3 or early Q4. What kind of what do you have in mind there? Why would that happen? It's election season. They got to pay off the voters. And mainly like for, I mean, I say this all the time and I've given this free advice to people. Look at corn and wheat and farmers. Uh, in the election er, election time, when Senate when the Senate has a lot of uh, uh, races going up, that they always give them a, a big deal. In twenty twenty, was it they they gave them a huge ethanol waivers, you know, right. to boost the corn price, to boost corn prices, okay. just pay off for voters. Okay, so uh, so potentially, and tell me if I'm wrong here. Okay, so um, the uh, the debt ceiling plays out. The Fed raises another one or two times. Mm -hmm. um, people get freaked out about a potential recession. We do see growth slow in QT and Q Q2 and Q3. And so there's such a feeling that we may have some recession or that certain sectors are hurting. So then that justifies some sort of um, rescue package. Is that generally what you're thinking? 
pretty much that's the political script I'm going off. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. So we could see volatility over the next say month or so, but then I guess going into August, September, as this stuff starts being talked about, no politician will will vote down a a package yeah. like that in election season, right? Of course not. It's likely to go through. Of course. Okay. okay, Adam, can you talk to us a little bit on the you know, on the tactical side? How how are you looking at the debt ceiling as a potential trade? What what are you keeping in mind, and 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 what are you looking at in terms of trading the debt ceiling? Yeah, so I actually was writing about this yesterday. I think the debt ceiling negotiations right now happening are happening at probably the, one of the worst times because when the debt ceiling lifts and the TJ refills, let's say they refill it by 500 billion, that's a transfer of bank reserves from the primary banks to the TGA. And then, so you're essentially draining their reserves. And then over time, uh, these primary banks who are pretty much forced to buy the treasury's bonds, they sell them out to you know, foreign entities, institutions, whoever else wants the bonds, but they, cause you don't just sell 500 billion right off the bat, right? I mean, the liquidity would be crazy. So they do it like slowly. Well, the problem to me that's interesting is one, the TJs, they're expecting the treasury department uh, and some estimates shows they're probably gonna have to raise the debt ceiling by about a trillion dollars by the year end. That's so it's a, it's a big cash grab. Uh, they said about 550 billion in this debt ceiling raise alone. Uh, Problem is bank reserves, while still elevated compared to pre-COVID, they're down 25, 23, 25% over the last year. They're down about a trillion dollars already because of the deposit flight into money market funds, uh, Fed's quantitative tightening. Then on the other side, you have um, global liquidity has plunged over the last year, mainly on the back of the G7 tightening, um, you know, doing their own tightening programs. So you, I, I don't know, I, I just, it reminds me of, in, so in 2019, Remember the September squeeze, the treasury uh, had issued a lot of debt. They suspended the debt ceiling. And then you had corporations do early tax filing. Bank reserves were down to like 1.5 trillion back then. And then the repo rate blew through the roof and the Fed lost control essentially had to essentially restart QE and keep the repo market open indefinitely. Um, so I don't know if that'll happen today. It could be nothing, but I find it interesting. I was reading a paper by the Fed, and they actually, they've admitted, that's why they do QT so slowly monthly, and they build it up, because they don't actually know what the right amount of reserve should be for stability. They're like, you know, it could be 1.5 trillion, it could be 3 trillion, it could be, they, they don't actually know until like, in hindsight. So I don't know, it could be nothing. But I, I do think they're going to be doing the treasury is gonna be doing a huge cash grab at a time where liquidity and bank stress, especially, I mean, we've already had three of the largest US bank failures, Credit Suisse went under, um, so liquidity is not looking great and they're about to just suck a lot of more liquidity out while the Fed's also doing their QT, uh, rolling off bonds. So on the trade side, um, I would say it's probably going to create some fragility in the system. I like the longer end of the curve. I just think that the inverted yield curve right now is, it's just not sustainable. It's killing banks funding costs. It's causing uh, deposit flight with the uh, you know, Fed's overnight reverse re the overnight reverse repo is still above 2.3 trillion, which is what's interesting because bank reserves have been leaving, but money market funds and the overnight reverse repo hasn't dropped below two trillion. So it's showing that the the QT, which was supposed to take away from money market funds and uh, overnight reverse repo, it's actually just taken away from bank reserves. So I assume that the treasury will be the same thing when they do the uh, cash grab. It's just going to pull out reserves instead of uh, cash overnight cash for anyone who doesn't know the overnight reverse repo is a place where banks and institutions park money like idle money or that's something they need to invest in short-term high quality assets basically treasury bills so they're borrowing the bill from the uh, fed and then they're collecting yields selling it back at a little bit of a higher price because there's a dearth of bills um so i don't know i mean the the short end might go up when they raise the debt ceiling because of the new supply. But I think the long end is going to just keep going down. I just I just think growth's anemic. Uh, con the consumers tapped out, student loans coming back online one way or another. Um, mortgage forbearances are ending. I think they're just starting to end. So yeah, and, and household debt is already at 17.05 uh, trillion. Uh, banks are tightening, loan demands down like every the last quarter. So I, I just, I, in a credit-based economy, it's hard to see yep. any momentum. All, you know, we all talked reason, about it. 
go ahead. All, all reasons for an economic package in the fall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it sounds like it. And, you know, we talked about a credit crunch a couple of weeks ago uh, on the week ahead. And it sounds like a lot of that is is headed our way probably late summer, right? I mean, it's it's all, yeah. we've already got it in the making, right? So yeah, I, I was telling, I was like arguing with people on a Twitter space in December. I was like, yeah, I think the feds are going to be done by uh, halfway through summer because the, the higher you keep the rates, even if they pause here, the unrealized losses on the bank balance sheets don't go away the, or their NIMS are going to keep getting crushed because now you have money flooding out into money market funds. Uh, so you have to raise the short-term deposit rates. Like I was looking at Ally Bank's quarters recently, their NIMS are down, their profit guidance was down and uh, they raised the, the the cost for like basically subprime auto loans, which, you know, basically the B's through E's rating on the, you know, on the subprime ratings. It went up like 700 plus bips over the last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's it's hard to see the consumers at this point who are pretty much getting tapped out and you can't refinance a car. You have to roll it into a new car. So a negative. Yeah. So I, I just, I failed to see what the momentum will be going forward without any kind of government cut. I mean, the only way that the Fed can fix the banking things by cutting interest rates, letting their assets appreciate, take pressure off the unrealized losses, let their share prices go back up so they can do some equity capital raises. I mean, otherwise they're just going to dilute themselves out here. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if you guys have any uh, different view. Oh, and 2009, 10 all over again. Yeah, and on the credit crunch, actually, I would, uh, we already know U.S. banks have tightened dramatically, especially commercial real estate. Commercial real estate's that's just not a yes. that's not a that's not an if; it's a when at this point. Oh yeah, we talked and, about that four weeks ago on the weekend. See how oh, far yeah. ahead we are on stuff. Yeah, yeah, you guys <laughs> did a great job. I mean, that thing's it's a ticking time bomb. Not to mention, there's 125 million square feet still under construction right now, and there was another 200 million planned, but we can assume those will be cut. Um, but the thing that's really interesting to me is if you look at Europe, so they do their own uh, bank lending like surveys. And the recent one with the ECB, <laughs> sorry, my cat jumped in my lap. That's all right. I got two of them. Trust me. They, they're all over. <laughs> right. Yeah. They just know um, not to go on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the interbank, I mean, I'm sorry, the bank lending survey for Europe, it was terrible. I mean, it was absolutely terrible. The, the banks were tightening, but the loan demand, especially in the property market, the enterprise market, the consumer market, all of them, uh, is down 80% in the property market. And uh, right. it, it was one of them. I mean, they did it on the top four, Spain, France, Italy, Germany. And it's just, if you have no credit, right? No, I mean, credit drives consumption at this point. If you have negative or flat real wages, which technically the US real wage has barely budged in 40 years, you have to subsidize it with cheap credit. That's the only way you can get the consumer mm -hmm. or the spending, yep. right? If the house is too expensive or the car is too expensive and your wages can't justify it, credit makes up the difference. And I just think credit, I mean, we learned from Hyman Minsky, right? It's it, it, it's on, private debt can't go up forever. And I think we, we're starting to see that at this point now. And it's painful when we hit that, very painful. Yeah, it's a big so, deleveraging cycle. I mean, look at Japan, mm -hmm. Europe, 1929 after, you know, 2008 after. Every time you have a deleveraging cycle, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty painful. And I think that's what, you know, to them, the fed, that's the plague scenario for the fed, right? You can't oh, yeah. have any deflation. Yeah. So they're going to probably do big stimuluses. I don't think they're done. I think COVID was like the new playbook. Mm. Yeah. I, I spent a lot of time in Japan through that deleveraging cycle and would go there probably every couple months. And I don't really think people in the, especially in the U S understand what that's like to be pretty stagnant for decades um, and I think yeah. if that's what happens here, uh, it's going to be a shock to many, many people. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, uh, Japan, I mean, if you look at what's interesting is if you look at like Japan and uh, Germany, South Korea, China, and I know we're going to talk about China, uh, they all run these massive current account surpluses. Like they have no demand in their own economies. They have to export that rest to get their growth. Otherwise, yep. you're just you're gonna have unemployment and deflation because you're gonna. Oh yeah, they're demographic goods. nightmares, right? They're, they're oh, demographics on top demographic of it. Nightmares. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's just. I mean, Japan has like a thirty percent net savings rate. You know, China's is like what over forty. Germany thirty. Saudi Arabia thirty. I mean, the, I mean, if you're not consuming, you're saving, right? And I think America's low. In the UK too, have very low uh, personal savings rate, and it's like, well, yeah, because they're, they're buying everything, they're absorbing all these countries' gluts. Right, and and 
the the retail investors save because where are they going to get return, right? Um, so they just got in the habit of not getting a lot of return for a couple decades. And that's a hard habit to break. It's a very hard habit to break. So CI Futures is our subscription platform for global markets and economics. We forecast hundreds of assets across currencies, commodities, equity indices, and economics. We have new forecasts for currencies, commodities, and equity indices every Monday morning. Uh, we do new economics forecasts for 50 countries once a month. Within CI Futures, we show you our error rates. So every forecast, every month, we give you the one and three month error rates for our previous forecast. Uh, we also show you the top correlations and allow you to download charts and data. You can find out more or get a demo on completeintel.com. Thank you. So, okay, since you brought it up, Adam, let's move to China, okay? Um, you had some really good charts uh, on China that you published uh, earlier this week around structural issues in China. And, you know, I want to I want to look at uh, kind of the soft, we'll say that, you know, um, uh, kindly kind of the soft opening that China had. I don't know that the word soft really fully captures it. So can you walk us through kind of these charts and why China's reopening has been so weak so far? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So the... So for context for anyone, yeah, basically China was under COVID lockdowns. They reopened all the mainstream pundits. Everybody was saying it was going to be like unleash inflation mm -hmm. across the world. And it was going to be like this huge thing. But, you know, I remember I just thought like since 2018, China has been deleveraging. If you look at their household debt to GDP, it's been flat. Uh, it, and it's almost as high as the U.S. is actually. Their governments are pretty much tapped out. They're in debt up to their neck. Very uh, The BRI... Um, the uh, uh, Silk Road, basically, initiative, brick, brick uh, whatever it was, when they were, uh, their loans are defaulting like crazy. Bell so trying to cut back on their lending. Yeah, Bell and Road, thank you. I, I've heard like multiple names for that thing. But yeah, yeah I mean, they have, they're they dealing with defaults from these countries. And and I see a lot of people, they're like, oh, doesn't China want to get their properties? And I'm like, well, th but they defaulted for a reason. None of these infrastructure projects are generate profit. They don't generate returns. So you're just transferring it from one country. Now China has to deal with it. So, um, yeah, so I, I just I just think China's consumer is very anemic. I mean, their current account surplus. So for anyone who, who doesn't know, a current account surplus basically is when you export uh, capital and goods relative to import. So the U.S. is a big definite deficit nation. Uh, China's a big surplus, current account surplus nation. But it also means weak consumer demand. Because if you're not importing and you're exporting the rest, that means that you can't fulfill your own demand at home. And, and like we just talked about Europe, uh, Germany, especially Japan, South Korea, all these countries have massive chronic current account surpluses because they have no demand economy. They don't have purchasing power for their consumer. Um, so they, they find it abroad. One of the other and things China that I'm sorry, just to interrupt you, that I, I think it's really hard for people in the West to understand is there is huge savings in, uh, in Asia, particularly because those economies historically have been very volatile and mm -hmm. credit is... Uh, credit, there is implied trust in credit when you take out mm -hmm. credit. And so Americans particularly are used to a very stable market, which is why we're so levered up, because we trust the market to be pretty stable, right? Mm -hmm. In Asia, those markets have been so volatile for so long that, you know, you look at what is the crisis of this five years in, say, South Korea, right? You know, there's the, you know, going back 20 years, the LG crisis, you know, all this stuff. There's always something going on, right? And so these are part of the, this is part of the reason savings is so high. Of course, they're uh, net surplus countries, but they also don't really trust their policymakers and they don't really trust their markets. So they always have to have something in the mattress to make sure that they can make ends meet when the next crisis comes. Yeah, that's actually a really good point because, um, Michael Pettis wrote a really good book uh, called The Great Rebalancing and he, uh, recently uh, Trade Wars or Class Wars. But he basically was he was saying that these countries, like you were just saying, they have to have a high net saving. The government effectively steals productivity from its consumers yep. and it has no social safety nets. Like in America, you have like what the 30 year fixed mortgage, you have social security, right? You have 
uh, unemployment insurance. You have all these things that just always promote consumption. Like they're always there to just keep liquidity going. But in China, they don't, they don't do any of those things. A lot of these countries don't. So they depend on having a higher personal savings, but it's also more insidious because the, the governments like in China, the state, uh, state owned enterprises, they take the money that the individuals are saving because they don't have as, they have a close capital account. It's not like America's mm -hmm. banking system. So they depend on their people. They force them to kind of save, meaning they repress their consumption. So they save more. And then they use that money to fund infrastructure projects for the SOEs. Like, so they, they've been doing it though for 20 years. And that's the kind of thing we've been hearing about China. Like, Oh, uh, China's going to take over the world. They're going to, they're going to grow. They're going to become a demand driven economy. But we saw with Japan after their crisis in 91, they tried that. That's actually what blew their economy up. They had trade tensions with America. They were running chronic current account surpluses. Their demographics started looking shady. They had asset bubbles, especially in property, eerily similar to China today. And then America did the Plaza Accord. They basically said, hey, you and Germany, you guys are running mass chronic account surpluses, meaning we're absorbing it. We're running the deficits here and you're pricing out U.S. manufacturing. You need to let your currencies appreciate. You need to allow more imports and less exports. Mm. Uh, and they the did end it. was, I think, at 220 or something then, or 240. I can't remember the number. Yeah, it, it had like a 40% appreciation between 86 after the Plaza Accord and 91. And, and in the same time, they started importing their exports to GDP dropped, but it popped their asset bubble and two, their household debt to GDP. Because when you have a stronger currency, you're promoting more imports. Their household debt to GDP went from like 52 percent to 70 mm -hmm. in five yeah. years. It's insane. Yeah. So China, I just see these countries and they don't want to have their currency appreciate. They don't want an open capital account. No, right? Look at they China this week. Want... They they devalued to uh, over seven. Yeah, seven. Yeah, they went back to seven. And it. To put it in context, I, I always see people say like, oh, the BRICS currencies, but the U.S. has run massive fiscal deficits, uh, uh, huge, right? $31 trillion in debt, uh, massive bet easing, $9 trillion balance sheet, eight, whatever, $8, 9000000000000 trillion. But the DXY, the U.S. dollar relative to foreign currencies is up 30% or, in, in that same time period. Meanwhile, China, which has run massive current account surpluses, which is supposed to be good, uh, they're because of the inflows their currency is actually down since in the same period. It's been like flat. If you look at every BRICS currency, they all run chronic current account surpluses. Brazil didn't, but now it does. It's actually becoming a huge one. All their currencies are they're down dramatically since 2008. So it just shows you that these, these people, they don't have the consumer to have the imports and they want to promote the exports yeah. at all costs. And it just, they do it by, main, you know, like China, they maintain their currency. They keep it cheap on purpose, cheaper on purpose. It's like a currency mercantilism. To go yeah, to goose their exports, right? They they need a little bit more exports. Um, they see the value-added manufacturing moving away to, say, Vietnam or Thailand or Malaysia or Mexico or something like that. Uh, and so, you know, you can still get really good basic stuff in China, but the, the, the value-added stuff is going to be somewhere else because labor isn't as cheap as it was once was right so mm -hmm. yeah you know the, and that, that was with those three charts i was talking about but uh, i do i want to hear if albert had any insight on this or anything yeah albert what's your thought on china you know everything you said was absolutely correct from the from china's uh, cash economy to you know the dollar and how it wor works in the world there's not really much i could to be honestly that i could really add i mean the only thing i can add is i know that China had staggered their reopening on purpose to help out on inflation, and you know, with with Yellen and in, uh, domestically, I mean, they're 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 not stupid. You know, they know they know the problems that they have, they know the problems that they face, and what they could face. Uh, trying uh, repeating what Japan had made mistakes in the future. They're not dumb. This is just you know, but I don't I don't really like when people make assumptions where China's like, oh, China's peaked and, you know, it's just going to be the end of China and so on and so oh, yeah. forth. Let's just, let's just take a step back here because China yeah. still can stimulate their economy uh, on a short term basis to the moon. You right. know, what happens is long term is a different story, but short term, they can do whatever they want. You know, yeah. they're just not, they're just pragmatic and they're not going to do something silly like that. So um, I know everything you said is, uh, you know, I agree with everything about it, especially the dollar stuff. It's like everyone wants to dismiss the fundamental details of, of like of economies and, and, the, and their currencies and just say, oh, wow, well, it's going to happen because of political A, B and C. And it's just not the case. Yep. And as you saw, 
the Chinese bureaucrats and policymakers, they are not stupid. They're in, oh. actually very, very, very smart. But within the bureaucracy, there are just things that they can't mention. There are policy directions they're not allowed to go, that you know, all sorts of things. So we sit on this side of it going, why aren't they doing X? Why aren't they doing Y? Don't they know? I mean, it's because they can't even mention these things. Okay. Or their their career is over. Yeah, so, they have they, they have a different dynamic. You know, we can have congressional members uh, say all sorts of stupid things like Bernie Sanders does all day long, right? Or, or whatever Republican you want to throw out there also. They can say dumb things all day long, right? right. You cannot do that in China. You have There's reperc political repercussions. You will end up in jail right. <laughs> if, you do, if you mention some things. Right. While we're here, I, I want to ask you guys about this. So with China, we had this... For a couple of years, we had this kind of China wolf warrior diplomacy, right, where they were very aggressive diplomatically. They would say really abrupt things. And China was, you know, the ascendant power. And, you know, they really needed to assert themselves in diplomatic circles. Right before the COVID reopening, that they switched on a dime and they became much more accommodative. Uh, much more collaborative. There are still moments of wolf warrior statements, but for the most part, they've become much more, I guess, uh, softer than they than they did than they were before. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that in terms of uh, kind of the political economy? I guess, like how how does that reflect China's view of its economy, um, Albert? That's a good question, Tony. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Put me on the spot on that one. I mean, I, you know, a lot of a lot of China's rhetoric and political economics is twofold, in my opinion. One, to stabilize their domestic economy for whatever sectors they're targeting, but also uh, has aspect of how they're going to be dealing with trade negotiations going forward with the uh, European Union, in my view. So they're going to have to they they do a balancing act of what rhetoric they can throw out there. Yep, that's. I think that's that's right, Adam. What do you think about that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I I think uh, the Chinese uh, government. I mean, they they must know that they're kind of in a a little bit stuck right now. I mean, and I agree with Albert. They could, if they wanted, to come out and say, "Hey, you know what? We're going to be we're going to completely rebalance our economy. We're going to be demand driven. Here's massive vouchers, massive subsidies." Let the open the capital account. Let the want appreciate. Go out and spend. Import. Blah blah blah. Um, but they, yeah, they don't want to do that. Like they're doubling down on the supply side. We've seen. I mean, look at look, we were talking about EVs earlier. Look at China's auto to exports to GDP. It's a, it already took over Germany. It's about to surpass Japan. I mean, in just the last three years. I mean, they really are subsidizing the export sector, and I think it's a problem because if the rest of the world can't absorb it, like we saw with Vietnam recently. Um, they laid off 6,000 workers. Vietnam is one of the largest textile countries, producers, right. exporters. Uh, they laid off 6,000 factory workers because they said demand's drying up for uh, Nike and uh, you know shoes abroad. And it just makes it interesting. It's because because they can't consume that stuff at home. Like They don't have the purchasing power to buy Nikes in their own country, so they depend on the exports. So now they have to deal with unemployment. And I just think China's worried about that because... Oh. You've I'm got sorry, official youth unemployment of over 20%. Official. For youth. Youth. And yeah. the problem with the youth one is that I was reading, there's another 11 million Chinese graduating college this end of May mm -hmm. uh, or in this cycle. So you already have 20.4% youth unemployment. Uh, and now you have a tidal wave of new graduates coming in. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, it, it's just a problem. I just think it just shows there's a lot of mismatches in uh, the Chinese economy. And I was actually looking at data from... Uh, Kikes and cakes in global, and they were showing how the the state owned enterprises' wages growth has far outpaced the private sector's wage growth in China, and it just shows in it they're both sinking, right? I mean, wages aren't rising in that country. I mean, I mean, in over the years they have, but the growth of that wage increase isn't going up that much at this point. They have a negative CPI, so they're having deflation basically at this point. They're PPI, the producer inflation, which is like wholesale prices, which is important for China because China is an export economy. So they're essentially exporting that deflation. That's been negative over the last year and even in month over month terms. So yeah, I just, I don't know. I think that their their leaders are aware of it because you know the CCP has like a social contract with people, right? It's like, hey, we'll give you jobs. We'll take care of you. 
security and you keep us in power but we'll take care uh, of you or we'll kill a few million of you so you know yeah it's one of those two right (laughs) china's always been really sensitive about civil unrest because i think if i remember right china's throughout history each time their empires kind of fell, it was because of internal like strife. Yeah. It was yeah. it, as yeah. most do, as most do, yes. Yeah, that's it, true. most yeah. do, yeah. yeah. So I and I think that when you have an economy or not economy, well, that too, but a population that large, you, you really got to be careful. You know, half of them, you know, get the pitchforks out or something. Yeah. It's 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 quite a lot. So Adam, you 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 mentioned a, a really important phrase, and I, I wonder if it could be uh, helpful for the world economy. You talked about China exporting deflation. Okay, yeah. so you know, typically you export deflation when you overproduce something, um, and so could China exporting deflation help us get over the inflationary hump in the world economy right now? Oh, absolutely! Could it accelerate yeah. us getting over that hump. Yeah, that was my uh, that was like my thesis back in December when everyone said China was going to unleash inflation. I was like, no, because their domestic economy is weak. I think even with the reopening, they were going to have deflation on the CPI side. Six months later, that's what happened. Mm-hmm. And, and then and then on the producer side, you had their supply chains reopen, not to mention internal demand weak. And since their exports, I mean, their current account surplus in the last, in the first quarter of 2023, it was the highest ever in the same period. Like you would have thought that they're, they would have seen soaring imports, right? Like mm-hmm. from- from reopening, but they haven't had it. They're, they're consumers, just anemic, what, whatever the reason is probably because of property prices, or like you guys said, they just, they're skittish. They're, you know, they're wanting to save the money at this point, but if you're saving, you're not consuming and the Chinese yeah. banks, the Chinese economy, you have to export that capital. You have to yeah. find some use for it because it can't just sit in their pile. I mean, you owe interest on the deposits, right? So you need to make an asset to be able to pay it. Otherwise you're losing money. And I think that's why we've seen them very, happily uh start buying u.s bonds again uh yep and it's, it's same with japan I, I just don't see how that trend will change and which with them exporting the capital to america i do think it's going to push weight down on the long end of the curve which is also somewhat deflationary in the long run and also um like you said with their manufacturing capacity you said they're overproducing compared to what they make and perfect examples cars like evs they're just dumping evs <laughs> And car yeah. autos like all over all the across world. Southeast Asia. Really. Yeah. All, and, and and this is the problem. I was talking <clears> to someone, they're they're like, oh, but the production side, it's it's good. They're importing stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it, but there's always like another side of the coin, right? And I don't think Southeast Asia, Russia, especially, now they're even getting nervous about it. You're crowding out their manufacturing capacity, yep. right? Like, how do you compete when you're subsidizing the hell out of your manufacturing export yep. sectors? And then it's flooding into these economies and it's pricing their own manufacturing out. And, and the ASEAN, the Southeast Asian economies in Russia, they're all big exporters too. So yep. it's hard to see them not doing some kind of trade barriers or then they're going to start subsidizing their own manufacturing. Well, that's it. You, that's that is it. it. And, and the problem mm-hmm. is though, you can't, and that's why I don't like the BRICS argument because if they're all dependent on exports, they all run current account surpluses. Problem is you can't all run a surplus together at the same time, right? Well, Someone has is- to have a deficit. Yeah, this is yeah. also where where when people say, um, you know, China and Mexico are going to partner up on, you know, value chains or whatever. Those guys are competitors. So yeah. th- those guys aren't partners. Those guys are competitors. Yeah, we, we've we've mentioned this so many times, especially the arguments that I've had where nation state interests take precedence over anything else. Yep. And you will see trade barriers pop up, like Adam says. You will see trade wars happen in the next decade. Yep. It's just it's just the reality of it. As as nations contract, they need to shore up their own domestic economy and domestic workers. And this is what you'll happen. Yeah, it's the next wave of populism. It's just yeah, sur- survivalism. Um, and that manifest manifests itself in populism. Okay, guys, uh, just real quick before we close up, what are we looking for in the in the the next week or so? I mean, I know the debt ceiling, but say Albert, you're watching the debt ceiling. What else are you watching? Oh man, <laughs> I was all about debt ceiling. Tony. No, no, no. You can go into that too. No, no. I mean, I mean, obviously, debt ceiling narratives are going to come out. They're not. They're going to be up and down all week long. Um, you know, the only other things that I'd be watching is actually oil to see what's going on with oil at the moment because the debt ceiling narratives give a recessionary 
outlook or a bullish outlook, depending on what side you're on. And oil is going topsy turvy. You know, I honestly think at sixty five dollars of oil is probably the floor because under that production issues come up, come across. So I would love to see it at sixty eight, sixty seven, so I can go long. But I'm going to be watching oil because of. I also have a thesis of a secondary inflation event coming in the second half or uh, late this year, early next year. Great. Okay. Adam, what are you looking at over the next week? Oh, uh, next week. I, I don't think any big things I'm looking at over the next week, but things I am going to, I pay attention to, uh, I think China's uh, retail sales and their uh, current account data monthly, um, J Japan's as well, and Germany. Those are the three I like to follow up. Uh, globally but i also think with the yeah debt ceiling in the market right now i think there's i was looking like tech is really bit up recently that trade's gotten really oh, crowded yeah, yeah oh, u.s yeah. tech and and then you have uh short uh regional banks has also become very crowded and it's hard because like i don't mind shorting tech i think that's i mean i don't have anything right now like into it but like nvidia and these things i mean i think they've just gotten way out of control with the ai mm -hmm. hype but um but, you know, good luck. I, good luck with tech. T good luck being in yeah. the tech if, if the debt ceiling thing gets done. I'll tell you that oh, right yeah. now. No, I agree. Yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And then the regional bank thing, like I do like as a contrarian that it's so shorted and crowded. Same with bonds. The ten-year bond right now is at like near record shorts. Um, so I like the longer end of the curve. Uh, I think yields are going to keep going lower. Uh, I just think there's an incredible savings glut in the world just i mean overnight reverse we we i mean there's just so much damn money deposits they pumped in and now that the banks are starting to curb back lend loans you got to do something with it and yep. and the government is the last borrower at that point right that's the idea if, if businesses aren't investing if the consumers tapped out then the government steps in to borrow and i think they're that's what they're going to keep doing but mm -hmm. it's going to drain reserves so i think even though sh regionals are extremely shorted at this point i think looking at a few um, I do think banks are going to have more trouble throughout the rest of the year. Mm, okay, very interesting. Guys, thank you so much. This has been huge. This has been such a great, great episode. So thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend. Thank you so oh, much. Great. Thanks, everyone. I really Bye. appreciate it.